and you know i am a i'm a free market maximalist yeah so i i do try to listen to the market Mm -hmm. and and react appropriately but um point that i was getting at is at least like in terms of like developer activity and friendliness it's hard to argue that ethereum doesn't have like a more vibrant developer ecosystem Mm -hmm. like there's just a lot more experimentation going on Mm -hmm. Now, of course, I would also argue, sure, a lot of them are really stupid ideas and scams and so on and right, so forth. Right, right. But if you, you want to innovate and you want to find the really cool stuff, you got to let people do a lot of really dumb, stupid stuff and fail. Right, right. And it, I I want to see people doing the dumb, stupid stuff on Bitcoin. Gotcha. Okay. Or at least tied to Bitcoin. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Hey everybody, welcome to the What Is Money Show. I am thrilled to have you here joining me on my mission to help shine light on the corruption of money. Now, if this is your first time listening to the What Is Money Show, I strongly recommend that you go back to episodes one through nine first, which lays a lot of the groundwork for many of the concepts that we explore on the show. These first nine episodes are my series with Michael Saylor and thousands of people have told me that this is the best podcast series they've ever heard hands down, and that it was instrumental to their understanding of money and Bitcoin. So if you're looking to start uh, a deep dive into the nature of money, I don't think there's any place better that you can start other than episode one of this show. Now, a little bit about this show and how it makes money. The What Is Money show is 100% sponsor based. So all of our revenues are derived from direct sponsorships. And I strive to be very selective about the sponsors that I work with, specifically only using sponsors that I use personally, and also choosing sponsors that have values which are well aligned to the values expressed on this show, such as freedom, education, self-sovereignty, etc. So what I'm gonna do now is a few ad reads right at the top of the show, and then I'll do a few more ad reads in the middle. And I hope you'll take the time to listen to them, as again, these are hand-selected sponsors, and I think you'll like what they have to offer. Today's podcast is brought to you by N. Wolf's Clothing. Wolf is the first startup accelerator dedicated exclusively to the Bitcoin Lightning Network. Four times per year, Wolf brings teams from around the world to New York City to work with like-minded entrepreneurs, pushing the boundaries of what's possible with Bitcoin and Lightning. The program is designed to help early-stage companies achieve product market fit, develop their brand, secure early-stage funding, and grow businesses that help fuel the global adoption of Bitcoin. So go to wolfnyc.com to learn more about the program or apply. Again, that's WolfNYC, W-O-L-F-N-Y-C dot com. Jameson Lopp, welcome to the What Is Money show. Long overdue. Long overdue indeed. And we get to do it in person in Miami here at Bitcoin 2023. Super excited to have you. Uh, Just by way of quick introduction, you are the CTO of CASA. CASA is a multi-key custody solution. Um, You're also an OG Bitcoiner, long-term cypherpunk. And uh, you got one hell of a beard. So <laughs> glad to have you on the show. Um, let's start talking, as we were talking offline, you were telling me some interesting things about Noster. I don't know very much about Noster, but I'm certainly interested to learn a bit. So what, you said you had this high level technical view of why it's an interesting new communications paradigm. Could mm-hmm. you walk us through that, please? Right. So, you know, a lot of people, you may have heard of Noster, you probably never used it. Not many people have. Um, I don't know that many people even know what it stands for. It's an acronym. Mm. You know, it stands for Notes and Other Stuff Transmitted by Relays. Mm. So, you know, you can unpack that. Uh, notes. Notes just means mm, texts, messages, right. passing, passing messages back and forth uh, amongst people. Though, you know, transmitted by relays... Basically, Relay is just a server. It's 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 no different than you know you call it Web two infrastructure. Mm-hmm. It's not nothing fancy. Um, but what's really interesting, I think, is the other stuff, and that's what people are are really missing. Because I think most people right now, if they are informed about Nostr or they're using it, they think of it as a social network. Mm. And a social network is only one of many things that you can build on top of Nostr. Now you do get some interesting properties as a result of, of how Nostra works where it, it 
similar to Bitcoin, it uses like public private key pairs. Mm-hmm. You know, you if you quote unquote sign up for Noster, all you're doing is generating a key pair mm-hmm. and then you are connecting to some arbitrary relays. And you know, these relays they, they don't even talk to each other. It's not a peer-to-peer network. Hmm. There's no like global broadcast mechanism. It's it's, a, it's totally up to you as a client to connect to them and then you know hope that the, the messages get to where they're supposed to go. Hmm. So right now, you know, people basically tweet you know their messages and, and we're using Noster as a sort of Twitter clone. And we get some some better uh, attributes compared even to things like Blue Sky or Mastodon, you know, the Fediverse, mm-hmm. because those things, they use federated models. They they are, you know, creating a consortium of servers. The servers do talk to each other. And you can still kind of get deplatformed mm-hmm. because your account exists on one server. Yeah. So if the administrator of that server says, no, I don't like what you're doing, well, they turn off your account and mm-hmm. you have to start all over again on another server. So unless you're running your own server, which almost nobody does, mm-hmm. I do, I don't recommend it, um, you then you, you're getting some you know better properties than something as centralized as Twitter, but it's not real, like pure sovereignty, uh, the, the style of sovereignty that I think we should all go for. Yeah. The cool thing about uh, Noster and, and being connected to many different servers is that even if you get quote unquote, you know, deplatformed or blocked by one relay, that relay cannot stop you from talking to any of the other relays on the network. Okay. And your public private key pair, you know, still exists. And so you don't lose your audience, you know, even if a relay decides it wants to censor you. Gotcha. But uh, yeah, stepping back from just looking at it as a social network, you can you can pass really any type of messages that you want. So to give you an idea, like anything where you're communicating or coordinating with other people. So you can create chat rooms. Um, you can even create games. Uh, I think somebody very early on created a, a way to play chess over Noster because mm-hmm. you're just communicating. You know, I'm moving from here to there and then the other person makes their move and so on. And uh, more recently, we've seen more Bitcoin-like um components being built on top of it. So we've seen uh, some folks actually start creating a way to to transmit Bitcoin transactions and create like mempool relaying uh, over Noster. Hmm. Uh, we've even, uh, to toot Casa's own horn, we had a team of our engineers that won a hackathon recently. I think it was the MIT uh, hackathon. And they created a project called Munster, which is basically a multi-sig coordination over Noster that also uses the new uh, Musig 2 you know, Schnorr signature uh, stuff so that like, you know, the signatures that you create don't even look like multi-sigs uh, by the time it's all done and, mm. and the transaction is composed. And so the way that it does that, it leverages another neat piece of Bitcoin technology, the PSBT, the partially signed Bitcoin transaction. Mm. And so those are the notes. The notes that you're passing are over this network are just these partially signed transactions. And now you can use the, uh, you know, the it's not a guarantee, but the, the general reliability of, you know, messages being received over this network uh, to be able to just, you know, broadcast out um, your part of the transaction. And, you know, as your, your counterparties receive it, they can add their part and you just uh, coordinate to join them all together until you've got a totally signed Bitcoin transaction. Wow, that sounds complicated yet interesting. So what what is Noster going to lead us towards? Are these like decentralized Noster apps? Are we going to have dating apps and other things? You certainly could. Noster? Actually, I, I'm pretty sure somebody has or at least proposed uh, some sort of dating app. Of course, it'd be a very limited pool of uh, of people on there. Uh, kind of reminds me. I think a number of years ago, somebody tried to create like a crypto specific dating app. Yeah, it, yeah. I think it was way too many guys on it. <laughs> I believe that. But yeah, uh, you know, really anything where you are just trying to either communicate or economically interact with other people. Mm-hmm. Uh, it is especially, I think, the economic interactions where things get interesting. Mm-hmm. And because Noster has been developed, well, Noster was invented by a developer who uh, was basically a Lightning developer, probably, I guess, still is. Mm-hmm. And and so one interesting result of that is that the, the development of the, the protocol 
has been very uh, tightly tied to lightning mm. to the point that um, pretty much all of the the at least the Noster you know Twitter esque apps are are deeply integrated with lightning and it's very easy like people are we're calling it zapping each other mm -hmm. uh, over Noster basically you know sending tips um, even doing stuff like uh, like 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 I said the economic incentive stuff is very interesting so. Um, you know, one developer actually developed a way to do a poll, but it's a lightning-based poll. So instead of, you know, you do a poll on Twitter and people click what they want. Mm -hmm. That's very, you know, easily Sybil attackable. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but when you do a, a poll, a lightning-enabled poll on Noster, people have to actually send the sats mm. so that the votes get tallied up, you know, economically. Yeah. Uh, you know, much, I think... You get a much stronger signal, of yeah. course, of what people really believe if they're going to put their money behind it. Right. That's super cool. So is this going to be part of the architecture of, or the re-architecting of the internet? I mean, a lot of people in Bitcoin talk about value for value and Bitcoin serving as this like new, kind of restoring the promise of the internet originally because it allows us to do microtransactions and things like that. Is Noster now a component of that or, or how does it fit into that picture? Yeah, I mean, I I see it as a new communications technology. You know, obviously, at a very low level, Noster builds on top of many other internet technologies. Mm -hmm. You know, we're not reinventing the wheel. Like, it still uses TCP. Uh, and I see this as a, a platform. Uh, so, you know, if you're going to build an app, it's kind of like we've had the sort of Web one, web two, web three, and then I won't even try to talk about web five or whatever that right. means. Okay. But you know, this is like another web something. Okay. Where the 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 real difference is the infrastructure, in that uh, you can build these Noster enabled apps, and you know they don't have to like have back end like server infrastructure. Okay. Like Noster is the the network of relays. Uh, that are just passing these messages around. The network is the computer. Pretty much. Yeah. And are you excited? I mean, this is an exciting new development. I mean, uh, people like Jack that have only mm -hmm. been excited about Bitcoin up until now are now excited about Noster. So, like, where do you yeah. sit on that scale? Is it something as significant as Bitcoin or close to? Yeah, I mean, I think it's significant in terms of... Mm, like having a a more censorship resistant way of okay. communicating, some more freedom of speech online. Yeah. Okay. Uh, now you know there's no shortage of challenges that need to be overcome, but I am excited, especially just because I can see the pace of development that's happening. Um, I swear my my um my Noster client gets a software update on like almost a daily basis, mm -hmm. and like new stuff coming out. Uh, you know, playing around with new functionality. And like I said, more and more apps uh, that are being developed. My understanding um, is that the protocol itself is so simple. Um, actually, one of, one of our engineers at Casa wrote a Noster relay with ChatGPT just by pointing chat GPT at the specifications for mm -hmm. the Noster protocol and the, the NIPs, the mm -hmm. Noster improvement proposals. And uh, it was able to spit out, you know, pretty good working uh, uh, Noster specification. I think he did it in Rust or something, but yeah. Wow. So are you, in 10 years from now, what, what will Noster be something we're using globally? It will be as impactful as Bitcoin or the internet? Like, where, how do you see this thing playing out? It's certainly possible, you know, if the incentives can remain aligned, mm -hmm. uh, if the developer interest continues to grow. Uh, right now, we're kind of at a lull in terms, at least, of user adoption. Mm -hmm. uh, there was, you know, some big spikes uh, first few months of the year, and mm -hmm. it's it's been plateaued since then, but doesn't seem to be dying by any means. Yeah. And on the development side, like I said, I've been seeing more and more activity happening. So. You know, development that that just means we need to have more people experimenting and mm. failing, and then you know sometimes succeeding and yeah. continuing to move forward. So, I think you know there are questions around the uh, the long term economics of the network because right now, 
almost all of the servers, the relays, are being run altruistically. Hmm. And uh, it is possible to charge you know, fees for you know, providing that as a service. There are a few that have done that. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, it's one of these like chicken and egg network bootstrapping problems. Yeah. So it, it's much like you know, in the, the very early days of Bitcoin, um, developers like Evan Andreessen, they were they were they couldn't give away Bitcoins. They literally wrote software to give the Bitcoins away the just to try to, yeah. to get more people interested. So we're we're really at that stage of development. And you mentioned there's no shortage of challenges. Are those scalability, or what, what categories of challenges are we facing with Noster? Yeah, so there, there's scaling challenges. Uh, there's plenty of uh, friction that's already been hit. Um, just you know, seeing what happens when you when you run an internet connected service that's open to the public for free. Eventually, people are going to abuse it, mm. and so we we've seen you know essentially denial of service type of attacks, usually unintentional, uh, but just you know people because the the protocol itself doesn't really have. Uh, arbitrarily length limits Mm -hmm. you know someone might try to push a gigabyte of like files or data you know through the server and so that's that's where right now like the the relay operators and the developers are trying to figure out okay like what are the sane parameters for Mm -hmm. like what we should uh accept like as a policy you know none of these things i think are going to be protocol level changes but you need some sane policies just so that the network continues to function Gotcha. Okay. Interesting. Well, I guess we'll keep an eye on that. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, the Gold Investment Letter. The Gold Investment Letter helps sophisticated investors navigate capital markets and maximize their profits in trading gold, silver, and mining stocks. The Gold Investment Letter seeks out the most undervalued companies and identifies special situations in the mining sector and then provides in-depth analysis on both their financial positions and future prospects. The Gold Investment Letter explores many complex domains, such as investor psychology, portfolio management, and macroeconomic trends, all with the goal of making you a better investor. The Gold Investment Letter offers a free version and a paid premium version, and I strongly recommend you at least sign up for the free version, because after having read a few of these issues, I can promise you it is a treasure trove of good information. You can sign up for the free newsletter today at goldinvestmentletter.com. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, iCoin Technology. iCoin has just released a sleek new hardware wallet. It looks like a mini iPhone, a little touch screen and camera on it. Uh, the device has no Wi-Fi, no cellular connection, no GPS. It's a strictly physically cold hardware wallet. Uh, like I said, it's got a high-res 3-inch touch screen. It's got a camera for air gapping the wallet. Uh, it's got optional Bluetooth compatibility. And it's a really a, a brand new UI, UX experience for a hardware wallet, making it very accessible, easy to use, not intimidating. And as we always talk about on this show, the only way you can truly own your Bitcoin is by having it in self-custody. So you need a device like iCoin Wallet to truly own your Bitcoin. Go to iCoinTechnology.com today and use promo code BITCOIN23 for 30% off of this new sleek hardware wallet. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, CrowdHealth. CrowdHealth is a Bitcoin-enabled alternative to legacy health insurance. Now let's face it, legacy health insurance is an absolute scam. Nobody can explain this better than the legendary comedian, Chris Rock. This is insurance. You got to have some insurance. You got to, there's an insurance. They shouldn't even call it insurance. They should just call it in case shit. <laughs> Man, I give a company some money in case shit happens. Now, if shit don't happen, shouldn't I get my money back? <laughs> so with CrowdHealth, instead of just paying premiums that you'll never see again, you can hold part of this pool of savings in dollars and in Bitcoin through CrowdHealth. And when you have a health event, you can draw against this pool of communal savings. So go to joincrowdhealth.com slash breedlove to learn more or sign up. Um, shifting gears a bit, we talked about offline before we started here, the idea of network protocol ossification. And as I understand that, you know, the internet is this stack of open source protocols, HTTP, TCP, IP, et cetera. 
there's sort of a free market process and eventually people kind of establish consensus on one of these protocols is like the de facto standard for mm-hmm. communication at whatever layer it is. Um, and many Bitcoiners often talk about Bitcoin becoming ossified as like the standard value transfer protocol layer, something like sure. that, of the internet. There seem to be a lot of advantages to that for Bitcoiners, right? If it becomes the de facto currency of the internet, obviously that it captures a lot of economic value, if not all the economic value that's transpiring on the internet. But you may have some devil's advocate perspectives mm-hmm. on network protocol ossification. Um, please enlighten us. Yeah, uh, so my my points that I'm going to be conveying are basically that you know we have decades of history that we can look at. You even mentioned TCP. TCP is a great example of a network protocol that ossified a long time ago. Mm-hmm. Now, we won't get too deep into the weeds, but it would be you know categorically false to claim that TCP is a perfect protocol that could not be improved. Sure. It's just, it's no longer feasible to improve it because of the, the network effect. It's like path dependence, right? Yeah, yeah. so, you know, look, uh, pretty much everybody agrees. It's basically a law of nature, call it even physics, mm-hmm. uh, due to the, I almost see it as like, as a, as a network based on a protocol expands, it eventually is the ability for it to evolve gets crushed under its own weight because the ability for the participants of the network to coordinate upgrades becomes harder and harder to the point that it's just not feasible without breaking a bunch of people and basically kicking them off of that network. Right. So as a result, I mean, I think there's consensus that network ossification is a thing. It is basically inevitable. But it doesn't have to happen sooner rather than later. There are things that you can do to uh, forestall ossification. There are techniques. Um, Unfortunately, a number of them aren't really applicable to Bitcoin. Like some techniques are to basically encrypt all the data you're sending so that it it can't even be rejected uh, because the the middlemen who are passing it around don't even know what's in there. Obviously, that's not going to fly on a consensus network. Um, usually what you hear about is something called uh, extension points, which is like you basically, you, you put little flags in parts of the protocol, which are, are saying, Hey, FYI, this is an invariant, AKA, this is a part of the protocol that we expect we may want to change in the future. Therefore, just be a little bit looser about, you know, how you validate or you know, accept or reject whatever is in you know this part of the the data and message mm-hmm. that's being uh, presented. Um, I would I would say that that is actually very analogous to how Bitcoin has been upgraded, mm-hmm. which is you know you take an op nop, you basically take a uh, one of the the, the Bitcoin uh, scripts operators that doesn't actually mean anything that Satoshi put there mm-hmm. uh, ahead of time. And uh, you repurpose it and you say, okay, going forward after some activation period, now this operation has a meaning and now the nodes that upgrade can interpret it to do this functionality. And so, you know, that works, but as we have seen, it is still very difficult to actually get consensus and deploy and activate stuff via a mechanism like that. Um, It's it's still pretty much inevitable that you get to a point where that's just a non-starter. Mm. So the the thing that I'm really trying to get to is uh, say that, you know, we need, if we want to be able to continually upgrade, say, aspects of Bitcoin's security, scalability, privacy, uh, and, and especially if we want to enable more permissionless innovation and make it easier for people to create second, third, fourth, however many other layers that they want and, you know, screw around and experiment in ways that can fail without necessarily harming Bitcoin itself, then we do want to see some changes to the Bitcoin protocol that will enable that. Because Mm -hmm. right now, like if, if we're being completely objective, the, you know, the initial vision of uh, uh, a sidechain universe with many, many sidechains 
uh, that can be pegged to each other. Uh, that vision has not happened. Mm. Uh, you could go down a whole rabbit hole of why, but you know, one of the reasons is that like we never got a trustless two-way peg. So mm -hmm. pretty much all the side chains out there are like glorified multi-signature federations, mm -hmm. which is, is not permissionless by any means. And um, I think especially like some of the activity that we've seen recently, the past few months, it's it's been interesting to me as a technologist just to see people experimenting. Mm -hmm. Yes, some people get uh, uh, dramatic and upset uh, about permissionless innovation, but I think that is necessary. Yeah. Now, you know, like you said, there are pros to ossification. Mm -hmm. Like there are there are sound logical reasons why people want Bitcoin to ossify, right. and that's because they want it to be more difficult for someone to break Bitcoin. Right. Uh, you know, obviously there's like the, the 21 million coin limit, you know, we don't ever want to see uh, changes to the subsidy schedule. Um, there's also people will bring up, you know, unintended consequences. Uh, and it's completely true that whenever you have software, whenever you have a platform that is programmable and Bitcoin is programmable money, mm -hmm. uh, even though most people will think of it as like, dumb digital gold you know that can't really do much you know it has a programming language um and whenever you enable new functionality it is likely that someone will find a way to leverage that functionality in a way that was not intended by the, the original service office. Yeah, yeah so you know s some people will rightfully say that you know some of the, like the ordinals and inscriptions and uh, brc20 tokens and, and whatever the recent developments mm -hmm. were not intended by the authors of taproot and tap scripts mm -hmm. and, and i think that's a fair claim to make uh but that's one of the risks i, I think that you have to take when, whenever you're enabling functionality mm. interesting so the and forgive me because I'm not super versed here, but there's a trade-off then between kind of the uh, adaptivity of the protocol layer and its ossification. So the more ossified it becomes, the less adaptive yes. it is. Yeah. So you know, another way to put it is, um, and I haven't even talked about really the parallels of all the other protocols. Uh, my favorite is actually SMTP. Okay. Most people know as email. Yeah. Because I spent a decade working in the email industry uh, before Bitcoin. And uh, anyone who's familiar with email, um, you know, they know email works quite well. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you go into your well. <laughs> yeah, you go into your email client and you write a message, and it it generally gets to where it's supposed to go. But under the hood, email is a monstrosity. SMTP has morphed into this really crazy meta protocol. The uh, the short version is that. SMTP was actually developed in the 1970s, I believe, mm -hmm. and it was designed to be a highly reliant message passing protocol, mm -hmm. somewhat like Noster, actually. Mm -hmm. In the early days, uh, people ran their SMTP uh, servers as open relays, mm -hmm. and so your, your email would hop through a bunch of different servers to get to its eventual destination. But what happened in the 90s when AOL became popular, millions of people mm. came in and started using email, uh, and that's when the spammers came. Mm. The open relays, they got overwhelmed, and the the email server administrators basically were frantically scurrying around trying to figure out, mm. how do we stop unwanted email? Because email was developed to guarantee delivery. It was never developed to stop delivery. There was The assumption was that people would want to receive the messages right. that, that were being sent to them. So you know, then we, we underwent a multi-decade series of different things that happened in the email ecosystem. Um, you know, there were these like... Uh, it started off off with really naive keyword filters and then more advanced like mathematical Bayesian filtering with spam assassin software. Uh, but none of those things worked very well. And eventually we ended up settling on reputation systems. Hmm. And the problem with the reputation systems is that the people who decided what your reputation were were centralized companies mm -hmm. that were basically surveilling the the whole network and trying to point out, you know, this spammer is at this IP address or sending this type of content or whatever. And so, you know, what happened, we had more and more centralization. 
And we had all of these rules get added to email as an ecosystem. But you see, SMTP as a protocol had ossified. Like no one was uh, even, I think, proposing changes to fix it at a protocol level, except for one guy, which we'll get to. Mm -hmm. and, and so after several decades of this, it the the bar and the level of resources required to be able to meet all of the criteria and 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 you know have a good reputation started it, it priced out like all but the largest enterprises. So as people I think are generally aware, today 90% of email users are captured by one of five companies. Right. So does email work? Like have we solved the problem of spam pretty well? Like email works pretty well, but at what cost? It is no longer possible to be a sovereign email user. You can go out onto the internet and you can abide by the rules of SMTP and your email will never get to where it's supposed to go because you have failed to follow the meta protocol rules that all of these centralized gatekeepers have put mm -hmm. into place. So short version is like, this is one of my fears of what could happen to Bitcoin if we ossify the protocol level. The way that I look at it is that oh, you can ossify a protocol and we expect that protocols will ossify. What's not going to ossify is the rest of the world. So the you know learning lesson you can take from email is that it's possible for a protocol to work and email did work for decades, but then it encountered stressors, mm. which was mass adoption by tens of millions of people and then the adversarial actors who came along with that, the spammers. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, email at a protocol level was was not modified to uh, adapt, you know, to react to the new world. Right. <laughs> and and so all of the the solutions ended up being you know sort of hacky, piecemeal, bolted on stuff right. that that created centralization. And it didn't have to be that way. Right. Now there was this guy in 1997 who proposed something called Hashcash. Mm -hmm. And Hashcash was actually, uh, you know, a new uh, SMTP header, mm -hmm. just like a new you know, one line of text you add to the, the top of your email message. Mm -hmm. And it you know, leveraged an, a neat little idea called proof of work mm -hmm. where you would basically, you would send the whole contents of the message through and you would hash it and you would, you know, you would meet some desired difficulty target. And what did that do? Well, you know, Adam Back realized that the problem of email spam was not one of like content um, filtering or reputation, but rather it was it could be solved by economics because it was glossless. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So he figured out that you could actually fix the problem, you know, at the protocol level and at the client side level, rather than creating these behemoth servers that were doing all this reputation nonsense. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's basically like, that's the path not traveled mm -hmm. where it's quite possible that had we gone down that path and had we adopted this change, you know, at the protocol level, email today might still be a sovereign protocol. Wow. Wow. So there's, that's an interesting saga of kind of path dependence leading us towards centralized email, but could have gone decentralized. Yeah. And, and it's an issue of convenience. Yes. Uh, so, you, you know, I glossed over a lot of details, but the point being like this was a natural organic evolution mm -hmm. that happened over 40 years mm -hmm. and there was no conspiracy. There was mm -hmm. no like authority that stepped in right. and attacked the SMTP right. protocol. Rather, it was a series of many, many, many small decisions compounding over right. decades, you know, extremely long time yeah. scales that was, it was really not even noticeable, I think, unless you were deep into it. Yeah. And, and I can say that because I was there, mm -hmm. I was I was running, you know, infrastructure at, e at an email service provider and we were sending out a hundred million emails a day and I was ingesting a lot of the the data and analytics that were coming back as a result of that and I remember only one time did I ever even have a light bulb go off where I thought something was was a little off mm -hmm. and that was 
maybe about five years in when I realized that, that we were hiring deliverability specialists who were not engineers. Mm -hmm. uh, it was no longer an issue of us dealing with um, messages that we, we were getting back from other email servers and trying to figure out how to deal with them. It had literally become a, a social engineering problem. Mm -hmm. The deliverability specialists, what, they, what were they? They were actually relationship managers mm -hmm. with the other humans at the, the ISPs and the, uh, the anti-spam companies that were the gatekeepers. And of course, this was all... Um, uh, it was pre Bitcoin or really, really early Bitcoin. So I, I was, I wasn't even thinking about decentralization. Right. I wasn't uh, prioritizing individuals being able to yeah. run their own email servers because I was getting paid <laughs> to make the email flow at extremely high volumes, and right. my job was to do whatever is necessary just to make it work. Wow! You know, screw all of the other attributes yeah. of the system. So there's there's times where the protocol fails to deliver on what it's intended to deliver, and we have to fill those gaps with human beings. It sounds like it's well and that that, that it's with... a convenient way. I think yeah. it's a it's a natural way of trying to address those type of problems. And that contributes to centralization, trusted third parties, et cetera. Is that a market failure? Well, is what is the market, right? If yeah. is the if the market is just to send messages back and forth, you know, email works. Yeah. It, it works quite well. Yeah. But of course, at what cost? Uh, you know, th the result is we are now putting a ton of our personal information into the hands of five companies right. because they're offering us free email services right, right, right. by basically harvesting all of our data and right. selling it and using it against us. Sounds like the free checking and savings accounts we've been offered for so long. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's very interesting. What can we learn? Are there lessons we can draw from that saga and apply to Bitcoin? Are there pitfalls we should be trying to avoid? How, do, how should we think about that in terms of Bitcoin? Well, I think we definitely need to be cognizant of any sort of like external solutions mm -hmm. that are being proposed now <clears throat> i'm i'm not anti like community banking model there has been a push recently for uh more custodianship via things like fetty uh, and, yeah. um, and and basically making it easier for sort of local uh, custodians to do stuff but the the thing that I am worried about at, at the you know uh, really high level view is just uh, creating systemic risk and weakness within the system. So what I've been fighting against for eight years by trying to make self custody easier, and in, in the hopes that you know we'll get more people out of uh, the large institutional custodian providers. Mm. What I'm afraid of is that you know eventually, just due to convenience and the sort of natural ways that, that humans uh, make decisions mm -hmm. is that we end up in a situation where a huge portion of Bitcoin is held by a handful of companies. They're probably regulated. They're probably very easy, juicy nation state targets, mm -hmm. or even just targets for hackers. I mean, just putting all your money in, in a few places creates so much risk, you know, both for the safety of the money itself and possibly for the governance of Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's interesting to think about. Speaking of self-custody, um, you've also talked about this mini scripts mm -hmm. change. I'm not sure exactly what we call it, but apparently it lets us write more sophisticated or better self-custody uh, schemas, I guess. Is that how you put it? Could you tell us about yeah, that? Yeah, think of it as a, it's a higher level programming language that is it basically gets interpreted and turned into the base bitcoin scripting language mm -hmm. and uh, bitcoin script is a beast like nobody wants to write bitcoin script it's very brittle it's hard to even you know think about logically if you're doing more complex operations mm -hmm. because it's something called a stack based language which I don't even know like any other stack based languages that are used like anywhere common. Mm -hmm. um, it's just not a paradigm that, that many developers are comfortable with. Mm -hmm. And so Miniscript makes it both a lot more um, 
developer friendly to to read and write and build and even verify like mm-hmm. the certain the correctness and, and attributes of some of the more complex scripts and then also it makes it more modular so you can you can actually start using tooling that's almost like uh, using pieces of a puzzle or you know lego mm-hmm. uh, you're, you're kind of uh copying and pasting you know blocks of logic around right so what does that enable us to do? It sounds like something like a microservices architecture or just modular component parts. What does that do for us in terms of self-custody? We get more options? It's Yes, uh, it, it makes it easier and safer for us to construct new self-custody architectures. Uh, and, and by self-custody architectures, I just mean spending conditions. Mm-hmm. It's like what happens when when you create a Bitcoin address and you deposit money into it? I mean, underneath that address is actually Bitcoin script. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's, it's, you know, a, an address is basically like a hash that has been transformed, uh, but the hash is of a much more complex uh, Bitcoin script that all it really does is it describes the possible ways of how someone can spend whatever money is in that UTXO. Mm -hmm. So right now, the vast majority of of UTXOs are going into just a single key script that says, you know, as long as you publish a signature that matches this one public key, the the network will allow you to spend that money. Mm -hmm. What I've been doing for the past eight years is I have been, been building using a uh, multi-signature Bitcoin script, which is it's a little more complicated, but it's still, you know, a single line. It just says, you know, here is a list of three keys or five keys, mm-hmm. and you have to provide, you know, two signatures or three signatures that meet those uh, public keys. Mm-hmm. Still very straightforward. But the thing is, Bitcoin script has other functionality. It has the ability to do uh, Boolean logic like ands and ors, mm-hmm and uh, time locks and uh, hash locks. Um, These are like some of the most fundamental, like basic programming, like logic gates, if you were. And it's a shame that basically nobody uses them. Mm. Uh, They they get used for lightning network stuff, Mm -hmm. but that's that's pretty complicated. why do we need to relegate ourselves to you know just using complex scripts for that? Mm-hmm. Why can't we create you know completely new uh, custody models that just give people more flexibility of you know preventing catastrophe? Mm. So you know there are you know obviously a lot of ways that you can just take these very basic building blocks and and construct new spending Mm -hmm. conditions. But some simple ones would be, okay, you know, I have a key and, you know, this is the key that I'll use most of the time, or maybe even it's a multi-sig and I'll I'll use this threshold of keys most of the time. But, you know, what if I want an out of, like, there's some catastrophe that completely blows up that key or that Mm -hmm. enough of those keys that I can't spend them. Well, now with the the magic of of Miniscript making it easier to write, and the magic of Tapped Script um, allowing you to create basically an unlimited number of alternative spending paths that you don't even have to reveal to the world unless you use them. So this is highly scalable, highly private. Uh, but now you can have as many alternate spending paths as you want. And a more practical example of that would be okay, you know, I have the multi-sig or I have the key, but if the funds haven't moved in several years, allow me to use this other key or other set of keys. And, you know, maybe those are keys that you hold. Maybe they're keys that are held by um, your beneficiaries and you could use as part of an inheritance plan. Maybe it's a key or even a set of keys that are held by an institution or a set of institutions, you know, multi-institutional custody. Um, The, the, 
really, you know, we're just scratching the surface right. here. It's very exciting right. as a developer because the, the gears start turning in my head. Right. And, and of course, whenever you create a new security model, you have to think about it very hard and try to think of everything that could still go wrong. Yeah. But it's still, you know, the possibilities are enormous. So you're expanding the design space of these custody architectures. Yes. And then is that something you guys are going to incorporate into the products at CASA, I assume? I, I think we would be stupid not to. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> nice. Very cool. All right. A lot of technical stuff. Very interesting. Thank you for sharing. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, Wasabi Wallet. With Wasabi Wallet, you can receive, send, and store Bitcoin privately. In Wasabi Wallet, your transaction history and wallet balance are completely hidden. Wasabi Wallet is easy to use. All of its privacy features are built in by default, and it works with any amount of Bitcoin. Wasabi users can make CoinJoin transactions together with BTC Pay server users or Trezor Suite users. For BTC Pay server users, they can make payments directly inside of a CoinJoin. And for Trezor Suite users, you can make CoinJoins directly on a hardware wallet. These features result in the fee savings and security improvements for both sets of users. So go to wasabiwallet.io today to download the state-of-the-art Bitcoin privacy wallet. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, Casa. Casa makes it simple to buy and secure your Bitcoin without wondering whether you're doing it right. Specifically, Casa provides a multi-key custody solution, which is by far the most secure way to custody your Bitcoin. Now when I talk about Bitcoin being theft-proof money or inviolable private property, a multi-key custody model is exactly what I am talking about. Using multiple keys lets you maintain full control of your Bitcoin while also giving you redundancy in case you lose one of the keys. It's also the best way to secure your Bitcoin for inheritance planning purposes. So go to keys.casa, that's C-A-S-A, -A, today to sign up and use discount code BREEDLOVE. Let's talk about something a bit more sociological. <laughs> Toxic Bitcoin maximalism. You wrote a piece about it. Uh, very lengthy piece. Mm -hmm. um, we've both been victims of the cyber hornet mm -hmm. toxic maximalism. <laughs> it seems to just go with the territory in Bitcoin. Like no matter what you do, there's you're going to piss someone off. Um, what are your, I guess, what's just kind of the, the general synopsis of that piece and what were you trying to explore from more of a cultural standpoint? Yeah, um... I was making a case that it's completely understandable how we got to where we are today. And that's what a lot of that is like a 40 page essay. Mm -hmm. Though there's also, I will say, Guy Swan did a Bitcoin Audible version of it. So yeah. if people want to consume it that way, that's certain. He's so kind. Yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, how did it happen? Well, you know, I went way back to the, the early days. I was, I was talking about, um, uh, Mercha Popescu, and I may be butchering his name because he's Romanian mm -hmm. uh, or was Romanian. Uh, he actually drowned a few years ago, oh. but uh, he was like one of the OG toxic maximalists who he didn't care if you, he was a smart guy, but he didn't care if you understood the points he was making and he would make them in ways that were designed to be offensive and outrageous mm -hmm. and, you know, shock value. And, and there's actually, there is a lineage here where some of the people who were a part of his his crew in the early days have gone on. Some of them have become quite prominent, uh, you know, Bitcoin influencers and social media. And, and, and some of that has matriculated. And, um, and of course, along with like the scaling wars, uh, that, you know, that was very inflammatory. And that also... Uh, created a lot more toxicity because you know we we're really fighting a civil war of sorts. It was like an ideological civil war, and so people were trying to draw lines and create sides. And we had an ex a real like explosion in the level of tribalism, yes. and it made sense uh, because you know people were defending right. their ideology of what is money. Yes, yes. <laughs> so yes. Uh, you know, there's a lot on the line. But then it got weird after the scaling debates died off. Huh. It got weird because like there wasn't really as much to fight about. Um, <laughs> right. And so a lot of people got really burned out from the scaling debates. And uh, we were kind of left over with some of the vestiges of that. And then, you know, we had a new wave of adopters come in like 2020, especially with the pandemic. Mm -hmm. 
And what seems to have happened is that a lot of the memes and the, you know, the short quips and narratives um, have been propagated and in many cases, you know, absorbed. Mm hmm. And, you know, memetics is very important to Bitcoin for a variety of reasons, and I've written on that extensively. Um, but I think that a lot of the the newer wave, they absorbed the memetics without absorbing the first principles. Mm -hmm. And so now uh, we have this sociological phenomenon, which is not unique to Bitcoin. Um, you know, many sociologists have opined upon it, but um, essentially we have people who have have risen to prominence merely by you know being better at you know crafting the the memetics and narratives mm -hmm. and getting them to go viral and propagate and so you know they have their audience um but the audience is uh is less deep on the you know right. the nuance and it, it's it's when we lose the nuance of the discussion that uh, things deteriorate and so right. you know you you know uh as well as i that you know you you get a lot of uh logical fallacies ad hominems uh, yeah. people just yelling stuff that doesn't really mean anything other than i hate you yes yeah it's definitely a good way to develop thicker skin i mm -hmm. think just hang out in bitcoin for a little while mm -hmm. um something i've thought of as related to network protocol ossification because my view for the longest was Toxic Bitcoin mass, toxic Bitcoin maximalism. I almost said masculinity. <laughs> Very indispensable when Bitcoin is young hmm. and small. Like you need to have this cultural immune system to defend the core consensus rules and, you know, maintain 21 million, small block size, etc. But as it grows and ossifies, there comes a point where that immune system maybe doesn't serve as much of a purpose because it's ossified right so the rough analogy was like well we don't have too many toxic http maximalists right <laughs> etc do you think that holds water like do we as bitcoin ossifies does toxicity kind of lose its relevance and then if bitcoin is attacked does toxicity then again become more relevant is it something like that yeah i mean um, this is actually an another of my sort of pushes against ossification is that uh you know if you want to be able to react to attacks you know mm -hmm. or or just changes um that you know it is important that i i do see bitcoin you know i like brandon uh, quitum and his sort of mycelium mm -hmm. analogies and mm -hmm. um i do see bitcoin as a distributed organism you know yeah. everyone who cares who's contributing uh it is important you know what they think and what they say and i i think the you know quality of discourse is important mm -hmm. for you know both for the the evolution of the protocol mm -hmm. uh, and for the defense of the protocol against all types mm -hmm. of threats, and you know it it is I think also inevitable that you, you hear the uh, the analogy of like the white blood cells mm -hmm. and uh, or or call them cyber hornets or whatever uh, you know defending against attacks and that, that sometimes those things will get triggered. When maybe they shouldn't, you know. Sure, sure. autoimmune uh, disease. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you know, uh, is it relevant or irrelevant? Uh, I think that one interesting phenomenon, my belief, you know, it's kind of hard to quantify. Uh, I do believe that this particular subset of the community, the folks who are. Uh, you know, perpetually online uh, mm -hmm. some have called them grievance merchants yeah. um, <laughs> I think you know those people at least some of them may be in an echo chamber and they may consider themselves to be larger stronger more powerful or more relevant mm -hmm. you know it's I'm not going to try to quantify any of this is very hand wavy yeah. but you know one thing that I brought up in my article is that look there's probably fewer than a hundred thousand really i think it was more like 30 or forty thousand, like bitcoin twitter accounts yeah in the context of everyone who like holds and uses bitcoin right. which is a hundred million that's a rounding error yeah, yeah. right <laughs> uh but you know it is it is very hard to say well how relevant or real irrelevant is that in terms of you know protecting bitcoin against certain types of attacks because like I said, memetics is important. Mm -hmm. um, 
I I certainly participated in plenty of toxic maximalist activities sure. myself yeah. when I felt like it was appropriate. Yeah, same. same. Uh, I just I don't feel like it's really necessary for the things that are happening right now. Yeah, yeah, this is a good way to put it. Do you think that uh, so uh, ossification is a bulwark against attacks, but it could also have trade offs that it were given up adaptivity. Mm-hmm. So. Does it, it depends on the nature of the attack, I suppose, which one is better circumstantially. You know, sometimes it's hard to even say, you know, what is an attack? Like, you don't necessarily even have consensus on what an right. attack is right. sometimes. And, I mean, that was even true during the scaling debates, right? Yeah. Uh, people don't like it when I bring this up. But, but you know, I, I was also, I was on both sides of the scaling debate, so I certainly see uh, the perspectives, but... Um, Obviously, the small blockers Mm -hmm. would say, you know, big blocks are an attack on Bitcoin. Decentralization. Yes, because they, 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 much like with email, they increase the resource cost to operate sovereignly and run your own node, your own server. Um, Big blockers actually, quite honestly, and it's not an incorrect perspective, it's, it's just a different perspective, they said small blocks are an attack on Bitcoin because they're pricing out people from being able to, you know, make their coffee transactions. Mm. Uh, and, you know, the coffee transactions were always kind of a humorous thing, but, yeah. we're, you know, more, um, more seriously, you can just say, well, you know, someone who lives in a third world country who only earns a dollar a day or maybe even less, and if it costs several dollars to make a transaction, then you are disenfranchising them. Mm-hmm. And so that was a, a great point of debate of, you know, what what should Bitcoin uh, offer to the world right. Uh, right. in terms of, of guarantees? Yeah. And of course, I believe we, we, I believe we rightfully settled on the fact that Bitcoin should uh, guarantee a low cost of validating the system yeah. rather than guaranteeing a low cost of transaction, tra- transacting at least on the blockchain. Yes. Um, pushing that up to higher layers yeah 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 it's interesting to think about because it is like you said we're sort of striving to establish social consensus on what bitcoin is there's not really maybe right or wrong answers there's Mm -hmm. just trade-offs ultimately Mm -hmm. and sometimes we make the wrong trade-offs like you said with the email protocol so hopefully we don't do that with bitcoin yeah well you know i'm just trying to raise more awareness around it and um you know, basically talk about the the other side. Really, what what is what is being left unsaid? Yeah, those are the things that worry me. Yeah, I think there's a quote, something like the height of genius is to be able to entertain two thoughts without accepting either. So we have to entertain and explore the nuance if we're going to make good decisions. So. Yeah, but you know, what is money? Um, and l- like I, I said, you know, Bitcoin is programmable money. Mm-hmm. So, you know, people people love to hate on Ethereum, and Ethereum has plenty of problems. Mm-hmm. I, look, I am not an Ethereum apologist, <laughs> uh, and it's true that uh, not only my current company but my previous company supported Ethereum, mm-hmm. uh, but because the market demanded it, really. Yeah. Um, and you know, I am a I'm a free market maximalist. Yeah. So I I do try to listen to the market mm-hmm. and and react appropriately. But um, point that I was getting at is at least like in terms of like developer activity and friendliness, it's hard to argue that Ethereum doesn't have like a more vibrant developer ecosystem. Mm -hmm. Like there's just a lot more experimentation going on. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, I would also argue, sure, a lot of them are really stupid ideas and scams and so on and so forth. But. If you you want to innovate and you want to find the really cool stuff, you got to let people do a lot of really dumb, stupid stuff and fail. Right, right. And it, I I want to see people doing the dumb, stupid stuff on Bitcoin. Gotcha. Okay. Or at least tied to Bitcoin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Jameson, man, thank you for doing this. Um, really, I appreciate it. It's a good download for me to learn all this new and in- interesting stuff. Where can people find you on the internet? Well, uh, it's easy to find me on Twitter. It's L-O-P-P. Uh, Nostra is a bit harder. I'm not going to try to spell out my whole uh, extended public key. Yeah. 
though, uh, you know, if you find me on Twitter, you go to lop.net. Uh, I have, you know, links to all of the other ways to find me. Great resource page, by the way, for basically all things Bitcoin, self-sovereignty, etc. So definitely check out lop.net. Um, thank you again. Thanks for having me. 